Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Evo 30. Pastor Ruben, thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at 9 a.m. This morning we will be starting a new book, the book of Romans, and we'll be in chapter 1. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and we ask, Father, that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher, and he would minister to us your scriptures, that we may have understanding of our surroundings, Father. And in this chapter, Father, that we may understand and um, easily, Lord, what, what, what the world goes through, Father, what the world thinks, how this culture uh, is designed, Father, so that when we understand this world, we can respond uh, to it, Father, in a godly manner and with understanding of the Holy Spirit's leading and guiding, Father, because we live in a world that's so complex, Father. There's so many systems out there of religion, of beliefs, of faith, from atheism, uh, Lord, to uh, Catholicism, Lord. <clears throat> and we're praying, Lord, that you would minister to us, Father, as Paul describes the Gentile world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, let's open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 1. And I'll give you a quick background. Uh, some of the commentators believe that this was written by the Apostle Paul from Corinth or from uh, Cecilia. One of those two most point to Corinth. Well, he was there and he's writing while he's on his way to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going through a great famine and they have raised money to help out the poor there in Jerusalem. So he's delivering the money to them. And he stops and he... I believe it's his second missionary journey. Some think that it's his third, but we're not quite sure. But on one of those mission journeys, uh, Paul uh, writes to the Roman church. He did not start the Roman church. Uh, some believe Peter started the Roman church, but Peter's never mentioned in this uh, epistle at all. It's believed that uh, some Christians from Pentecost that we see there in Acts chapter 2 and 3 uh, may have migrated to Rome and started a Christian church there. And so Paul now is ministering there uh, to the church that is growing uh, rather quickly there in Rome. And so he starts off with chapter 1, and he describes the Gentile world. This is the unbelieving world. This is how they view life. It's their worldview. It's not the Christian worldview. Um, it is not the biblical worldview. But this is their view of life, and it entails... Uh, a to Z uh, of all kinds of philosophies and thoughts and so forth. So he gets into some pretty deep issues here that we still deal with today. And of course, his letter always starts with his, with his signature. Verse 1 says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Tonight we'll be looking at Leviticus chapter 21, and these next two chapters will be dealing with the separation of the, of the priest and the high priest, and how they're separated unto God for service. And Paul here in the New Testament uh, uh, writes that the apostles and leaders are also separated unto the gospel of God. So there really hasn't had been much of a change uh, from the separation unto God of the Old Testament priests to the New Testament uh, leaders and teachers, pastors, evangelists, and so forth. They're still supposed to be separated unto God for a work. And that includes a total surrendering of a life, totally dedicated to God. Uh, their life is no longer their own. Uh, they don't have uh, the social network that Maybe they had before they were leaders in the church. Uh, now their social networks include other leaders and possibly uh, those within the church itself that they minister to. But it's a very lonely job, and it's one that they're called to do so. And so Paul gives that uh, characteristic of his calling. And he says in verse 3, Concerning the Son of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to you, or declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, and through whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his namesake, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. So that's his introduction, and he 
uh, qualifies his introduction by the fact that it's through Jesus Christ who resurrected from the dead. And not only is he called, but also all believers are called to be separated unto God. And that's something that we need to understand because I quite often heard throughout the 25, 30 years that I've been serving, people say, well, I'm not a pastor. I don't need to be separated unto God. I don't need to do that. I don't need to do that. That's your job. And, and the fact is, the Bible never teaches that. It's all of our jobs to preach the gospel. It's all of our jobs to live a separated life to, to God. And he makes that mention here in verse 6. Now he writes to Rome here in verse 7, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now, Paul is acknowledging the work that Roman is, Rome, Rome, the Christian Romans are doing there, Christian Gentiles, not Romans. <clears throat> well, they probably include some sort of Romans there. But he acknowledges their faith and the work that they're doing in the faith. You know, I was thinking about this the other night because I don't overemphasize this, but periodically when we have meetings and so forth and, and prayer before Sunday service, I, I thank the Lord for the servants that he has here. But I don't normally go around, you know, um, patting people on the back for what they're doing here. Uh, I don't go and, uh, you know, um, give them attaboys and things like that. And there's a reason for that just because of my upbringing in the Christian church, being being taught by Pastor Chuck Smith that when you're looking for accolades, when you're looking for approval, when you're looking for thanks, that's your reward. You're not storing anything up in heaven. So I have that in my mind. But I also know that the scriptures talk about Paul, you know, giving God thanks for their faith fullness to the Lord and to his work. So there's a balance there, and I'm still trying to learn that balance with people. Um, I appreciate everything that everyone does in this church. I may not go to every individual, but I definitely do appreciate it. So just because I'm silent at times doesn't mean I don't appreciate it. Uh, I can't do it without it, without the help that people give here. There's just no way humanly possible for me to do that. Uh, we were, I was at a meeting yesterday, and Pastor Rawl says, you need to find faithful men. Uh, he was talking to all the pastors there. You need to find faithful men that will be faithful, that will be able to do the work with you because you can't do it. And he went back to Exodus chapter 18 when Moses all of a sudden uh, had to counsel all of Israel. And his father-in-law said, hey, you can't do this by yourself. You need to raise up men from the elders, raise up good men, faithful men, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, born again believers that will be able to know your heart in God's heart and be able to minister to those people and then bring the harder cases to, to yourself. But there's just no way you can do that. And so there's a waiting period that takes place in the church. Uh, so the Lord raises up a man. Uh, for instance, I'll give you an example because the Lord is raising up uh, Carlos right now to be a youth leader. Um, it's not something that I pursued or, or saw in him. He would talk about the youth every so often, but it was on his heart uh, deeply. And he just recently went up to the youth conference and he came back saying, God's calling me to the youth ministry. And I says, yeah, I could see it. I could see it before you could even see it because his heart was always for the youth. He was always hanging around the youth. He was always concerned about the youth, you know? And so God was leading him, but I didn't push him. I didn't go and say, hey, you need to be the youth leader. I, I want God to do that and, and God has done that. And so I think he's gonna be a, a great youth leader Amen. for our church, so. But I am thankful to the Lord for all those who have been faithful uh, to God. He goes on, For God is my witness, whom I serve with all my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if by some means now at least I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. So his heart was to go to them personally and minister to them, to see them. Uh, here's a pastor that loved to see uh, the people that he wrote to. Paul was one of those guys, and he'd said that to most of the letters that he wrote. He would say it in there, I want to come see you. You know, if I get a chance, I want to, you know, uh, visit you and, and so forth. So he was one of those pastors that did so. He wasn't one of these pastors that didn't want to see them, that just kind of taught and then they left. You know, but no, he mingled among the people. He loved to have fellowship with the people. And there are two types of pastors. There are those that don't like to do that, and that's their prerogative, and God blesses them because they have some big ministries. You know? And then there's other pastors who like mingling among the people. God doesn't bless them as much, but they're still blessed. They have a church, they have friends, and they're doing what God has called them to do. 
And so Paul here is saying that I wanted to come and, and see you. Um, and he goes on, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. Also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, and for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It was this scripture here that changed Martin Luther's life. He was a reformer. He used to be a part of the Catholic Church, Catholicism. He wrote and studied the scriptures and began to realize that a Christian does not walk by works, but walks by faith. Uh, at our next discipleship meeting, we're going to talk about that. Works, works, works and grace. Uh, which one do you walk by? You walk by works or do you walk by grace? That's a good question to ask. Do I view everything from the works perspective or do I view things from the grace perspective? Uh, whichever way you view will determine your joy in your heart. If you view it in the works way, I'll say this much, if you view it in the works way, then there will be some hardship, it will be difficult, there will be some, some challenges in your maturity, in your response, if you look at it through the grace, grace way and you're really looking at it through grace, there will be joy, there will be peace, there will be happiness because you're living by grace and not by works. And there's a big difference. It's something that you need to think about and think in the scriptures about how God has been so gracious to us. So it changed his life and he wrote that thesis, pinned it on the wall, and thus we have Protestants today who believe that the just, that is those who are justified by God, that they live by faith through grace. So he goes on now, and he begins to talk about the Gentiles and how wicked they really are. And, and when you read this part of Romans, um, read it in the sense of its culture and the times of Rome, because homosexuality, sexuality in Rome at that time was rampant. Uh, we saw the story of of Herod, or, or yes, of Herod, right, uh, who saw his daughter, stepdaughter, dancing before him and said, look, if you dance, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. And all she wanted because of her, her mother, the head of John the Baptist. So that was a sexual dance that was before him and many other men. Uh, the first lap dance, the first stripper, whatever you want to call it, but it goes way back to the times of the Canaanites that uh, Moses is trying to get the priests not to entertain and allow their daughters to become prostitutes and become a part of the temple prostitutes that the Canaanites used to have. So sexuality and sexual sin has always been around from the very beginning and has always been a stumbling block for people. And so we see that here in, in rampant in degrees too. So. so he just starts right off in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who surpass the truth in unrighteousness because what they what may be known of God is manifested in them for God has shown it to them so what he's saying there is that every man in this world without Christ he's talking about people without Christ every man in this world knows right and wrong what God has given them and manifested to them there is a sense of guilt when they are committing adultery when they are committing a fornication, when they're committing homosexuality, when they're doing all the abased things, there's a form of guilt, and yet they deny it. And he, so he says, so the wrath of God is coming down upon those people who would rather live for themselves and not for God. He goes on, for since the creation of the world has invisible attributes, 
His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their, fool, their foolish hearts were darkened. So here's, here's something that's been written for thousands of years, and they're just now coming to light that God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, they're seeing that things that are in this world uh, were created by some intelligent design. And that's what Paul is saying here. Look, before everything was even created, there's an invisible attribute that's there. You just see it, and it's God himself. When you look at the mountain range, you, you don't say, wow, look at that beautiful evolved range. No, you say, look at that creation. Because you don't have a scenery like that without someone creating it. You don't have a painting on a wall without someone creating it and painting it. There has to be an originator. There has to be a creator of that. And that's what Paul is saying here. There's without excuse because everything points to God when you look at nature itself. And that's why the wrath of God is coming upon them because they know. So I believe that most people know that they're sinning. I believe they sin willfully. I think there are some that are sinning ignorantly and they don't fully understand, but I believe that they really do know. And then he goes on, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him. Now, verse 20. Uh, to professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So instead of glorifying God, they create their own gods. And so they look to birds and say, oh, look at that beautiful bird. I'll call it a god. Or they'll look at a, the power of an eagle. Look at that beautiful eagle. What a god. Or they'll look at Oprah Winfrey, who has created billions of dollars and who has ministered to millions of women, and they'll say she's a goddess. You know, so they create gods for themselves uh, that they can look up to. But one day, you know what? One day Oprah will die. <laughs> and she's going to stand before God. Uh, and gods don't die. And she will die. And so this is what the world does. This is what they do. They create gods. And, and not necessarily human beings like Oprah, but creation itself or even created things. They will worship created things over the, over the fact that they'll worship God. They'll go to, they'll go to concerts before they go to church. Uh, they'll go to um, amusement parks before they uh, have fellowship. Uh, they look for other things to bring them joy and peace and happiness instead of God bringing them that joy, peace, and happiness. Anything, anything to satisfy their souls and their spirits, which only God can satisfy. But they'll look to all these things that will never do that. They just never do. You will always be unhappy until you come to Jesus Christ. So that's why he says, professing to be wise and become fools. Now, he further describes them. Look at verse 24. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts. So this is a heart issue. These are all heart issues. All our sins are heart issues. You may, you may have hatred, but it's really a heart issue. Your heart isn't right before God. You're not trusting God. You're not believing God. Um, and so thus the hatred is coming because you're trying to become God. And you're trying to have revenge. You're trying to have judgment and vengeance and all these things when that's God's place. And so it all stems right back to God in our relationship with him. How we treat people is a reflection in how you treat God and what you believe in God. It's all a reflection of that. Everything we do is a reflection of God. The way we speak to each other is a reflection to God. It reflects your communication to the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> so he talks about the, uh, the lust of the heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchange the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever and then he says amen because it's true uh, the creator god himself is blessed forever for this reason god gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the women burned in their lust for one another men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the heir which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled 
with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, not only do, do, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, he just went through a nice list there. And if we were to take each one of those and, and compare them to the world, we would see it all in there. Amen. We would see it all in there. We, would, we could take every political issue and, and use this as a transparent up against it and see what is really running that whole issue. We can, we can put it right up, right up to uh, the abortion situation in New York and the other states who have legalized it right up to the point of birth. And we can see that they're, they're undiscerning, they're untruthworthy, they're unloving to the unborn. They're unloving to the unborn. They're, they're not merciful uh, to the unborn at all. All they think about is their body and their pleasure. And God says that he's going to bring judgment upon them. But he also says he's going to bring judgment on those who just stand by and watch. Remember last week we looked at Leviticus? And it said the same thing. If you just stand by and watch, that God's judgment comes upon you too. <clears throat> so as Christians, we have a responsibility, you know, to, to vote. You know what's sad? And I love my Christian brothers. They, a lot of them have been here for years. And every four years or every two years or so sometimes, just depends on when voting comes around, I get political. Because I believe that the church needs to be political. I think it needs to vote. I, need, I think it needs to, to voice its, its moral um, truth, the moral truth of God, and hopefully keep this world under check to a certain degree. We can't completely change it. You know, and there are those pastors that say that, you know, well, we can't change it. Let's just preach the gospel one person at a time. Well, of course, we preach the gospel here, too, and we'll continue to do so. Everything we do here is to get an opportunity to preach the gospel and see someone saved. But we also need to be salt and light. And it's sad because uh, this last election, we lost a lot of people uh, from this church just because of that. Just because of that. You know, they read their scriptures that they're just standing by and letting the government do what they want. They're just as guilty. They're just as guilty. And I don't say that can condemn them. I'm saying that to hopefully they understand what God has asked us to do. He's asked us to be righteousness and to be light and salt to this world. And they would rather leave the church and find another church instead of standing by a church that is trying to be as biblical as possible and not just be another Christian worldview or a worldview, but a biblical worldview. And it's sad, and I'm saddened by it because it does affect uh, the true church of God that is out there that's trying to impact the world. And I say that out of love, and I say it because it's the truth. I'm not saying it or gossiping that uh, these things might be happening. No, they are happening in the church today. And that's a sad place uh, for the body of Christ because it makes us ineffective. Uh, it makes us ineffective out there. We're not changing the laws because we're not standing up to evil and we need to stand up to evil yes we're to love yes we're to preach the gospel yes we're to share uh, yes we're light you know uh to this dark world but we're also to stand up to evil the bible says that very clearly let's pray gracious father we thank you lord for your word and boy there's just so much in this chapter that we could probably just take hours to just sit down and fellowship what's going on in our world today just the um the anarchy that has been been stirred up within the political arena. Mark my words, I'm not a prophet, but mark my words. We're going to see youth and we're gonna see organizations begin to riot and to begin to fight on the streets, just like they did in, in Britain and London and the U UKs. Uh, we're gonna see them rebel against righteousness, against the Bible, against truth, because of the leadership here who are instigating and creating this type of heart in the secular world. We're gonna see that. Uh, we may see streets barricaded because people are gonna riot and they're gonna have their, their guns and their uh, bats and their things destroying uh, 
uh, things. It's coming. It's coming. I'm telling you, it's coming, just like it, it has in the UK. And we're following rather quickly right behind them. And, and Lord, um, we're just standing by because it doesn't affect us. I, I'm doing okay. I'm living in my house. I'm, I'm sticking to myself. It's not bothering me. So why should I care what other people are doing? And the Bible says the opposite. And I pray, Lord, your church would repent and they would turn back to Christ and they would come back to church. They'd come back to the church where they started, come back there and humble themselves, surrender themselves uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ and serve in humility, thinking more highly of others than they think of themselves. And I pray, Lord, the church would repent. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 God bless you. Have a wonderful day. I pray the Lord bless you today.